let's see here. This is from ABC News. So the numbers had lied. The Redskins, how who we thought they were, huh? Their defense is. Yeah. In Florida, the governor is running for Senate and he gets to pick his own voters. This is by Roy Hada. R O E Y, that's the first name, Hada, H A D A R. It was published on August 26th of 2018 and is from abcnews.com. Joey Galasso lost his right to vote in 1998 when he was sentenced to three years in a Florida prison for being an accessory to robberies his brother committed. After he was released, Galasso waited 12 years for the Florida Board of Executive Clemency to give him a hearing on restoring his civil rights, including his right to vote. In that time, he started a flooring business volunteered as a Bible study leader, and even took up careers as a bouncer and MMA fighter. Yo, speaking of MMA fighter, Habib, Habib, you my favorite Russian, yo. Right now, you my favorite Russian. Not a Martian, I mean. You my favorite absolute Russian, dude. I ain't even gonna lie. You hopped over there with some ass, fool. But yeah, you my favorite Russian right now, dude. But that, 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 that's, that's a lot while I can bother. After he was released, Galasso waited 12 years for the Florida Board of Executive Clemency to give him a hearing on restoring his civil rights, including his right to vote. In that time, he started a flooring business, volunteered as a Bible study leader, and even took up an other careers as a bouncer and MMA fighter. In March of 20, 2013, he faced the board. Attorney General Pam Bondi and Chief Financial Officer Jeff Atwater seemed to support his case. But Governor Rick Scott took issue with Galasso's past speeding tickets. You've been out of prison 11 years and you've got all these traffic violations. You've turned your life around, but if you, if you really don't care about the law and you have all these traffic violations, it's hard to say, gosh, you really believe in the law. It's hard to say, gosh, you really believe in the law, Scott said in the hearing. A few days later, Galasso received a letter saying that the governor exercised his executive power and decided to reject Galasso's application for a restoration of voting rights. Galasso told ABC News during a phone interview five years after the decision that he has no issue with Scott but that the system needs fixing. Florida is one of three states where all felons lose their right to vote with no distinction between violent and nonviolent felons. Okay, with no distinction, only one in three. So three states have no distinction at all. I bet you it's Florida, Iowa, and Kentucky. Of those four that I referenced earlier from the Demo with Jones uh, article. I don't have anything personal against Rick Scott, but we need to have something in place. We can't have one man have so much power, Galasso said. Stephen Warner voted illegally in the 2010 election because he's a convicted felon and the clemency board had not yet heard his case. But in December 2013, he went before the board seeking restoration of his, of his voting rights. He ended his request with a personal appeal to the board's most powerful member. I filed for voting rights and I voted for you, Warner told Scott. Scott laughed and a few seconds later moved to restore Warner's voting rights. With the agreement of the two fellow Republicans on the board, the governor's motion took effect. Warner could now vote. This process in which felons who have served their time apply to a board of four elected state officials for various forms of clemency, including the, rest the restoration of their voting rights, is the only way for felons in Florida to regain their right to vote. The state constitution, which was written 150 years ago, when slavery was still, when all those sugarcane, all those farms down there, all those plantations down in Florida was being found by slaves. The state constitution gives the governor the unfettered, the unfettered discretion to deny clemency at any time for any reason, 
in line with the Supreme Court decision that gives governors the right to develop their own processes for granting clemency. As long as the governor gets the support of two other members of the board, which also includes the elected attorney general, chief financial officer and the agricultural commissioner, he or she can restore voting rights to anyone. All these people are elected, yeah. The attorney general is elected, the chief financial officer is elected, and the agriculture commissioner is elected. Nearly 1.7 million people in Florida, almost 10 percent of the potential electorate, do not have the right to vote because of Florida's laws. The highest numbers in the nation, according to a report from the sentencing project. Florida has almost as many felons disenfranchised after their sentences as all other states combined. You know, those seven states, remember? They were all like redneck states. I can remember some of them. Alabama, Mississippi, Kentucky, Louisiana. I got some of them right. The issue has come under increased scrutiny in recent years amid court challenges to the clemency system and the Amendment 4. An upcoming November referendum where voters will have the opportunity to amend the state constitution to automatically restore voting rights to nonviolent felons. The, the amendment I was telling you about is Amendment 4. That's what it's called. Now I see it. Okay. Adding another com complication to the system, Scott is running for U.S. Senate in the pivotal midterm election, and Commissioner of Agriculture Adam Putnam is a Republican candidate for governor. Both appear on the ballot for Tuesday's primary. So one of the people he had on this board with him is trying to be the governor of the position he had. So pretty much everything Rick Scott was doing, he's going to continue doing anyway. And Rick Scott trying to get in, get in the Senate. Please, if you live in Florida, y'all, if you live in Florida, please make sure Rick Scott don't get to the Senate. And please make sure Adam Putnam, the next governor of Florida, is not named Adam Putnam. And the next senator from Florida is not named Rick Scott. Please, send these guys a message that all their policies, all, all their ideas of what it means to be a citizen of this United States is wrong, like it's done. Adding another complication to the system, Scott is running for U.S. Senate in the pivotal midterm election and Commissioner of Agriculture Adam Putnam is a Republican candidate for governor. Both appear on the ballot for Tuesday's primary. In effect, Scott and Putnam both have had the power to significantly shape the electorate for their own election bids. See? In four years of office, in, in four years of office, Scott's, Scott's predecessor, Charlie Christ, restored voting rights to more than 150,000 people. In the more than seven years of Scott's governorship, he has restored voting rights to fewer than 3,000 people while leaving more than 10,000 applications for clemency still pending. Do you see that? Like, so pretty much Rick Scott became governor in Florida under the, the Tea Party wave banner during Obama's term, you know what I mean? In 2011, you know what I mean? All that good shit. She was a big thing with him and Charlie Chris. But long story short though, the Democratic governor who was in office restored the voting rights of more than 150,000 people. And I know Tea Party people try to make that sound like, oh, those are illegal immigrants. No. How could he do that when Obama was already deporting people? People have been are deported. I'm going to tell you one thing right now. As an immigrant in America who knows a lot of the ins and outs of the laws more than 85% of Americans do. Yes, I am right. 85% of you I don't know shit about being an immigrant in this country. So you ain't supposed to. You're not an immigrant. But you know what I mean? So long story short, though, if you're illegal in this country, if you don't have a green card in this country, you can't even go near trying to fill out an application to vote. So yes, he wasn't restoring the votes of illegals. He was restoring the votes of people who did something wrong at some point in their life got convicted by a jury of their peers. That might have even been questionable, but we're not going to touch that. You can't cry over spilled milk. But now they're back in society. They've, 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 they've assimilated back to the society that they were supposedly harmed. So they've paid it into society. One of them became on the floor business. 
he probably did the flaws of probably 5,000 people who voted against, who voted for, for Big Scott, who, who denied his application. You see how the cycle goes? Galasso, who I, I first talked about in this article, who was first talked about in this article right there, he probably did the flaws of probably 1,000 or two or three or 4,000 people who voted for Rick Scott who denied his clemency to, for his right to vote because Rick Scott knew he was going to vote Democrat. I'm sorry, Galasso, you were now one of the lucky Scott 3,000. Scott has faced allegations of voter suppression from political opponents and advocacy groups, with Democratic candidates incorporating it into their attacks on Republican opponents. Tallahassee Mayor Andrew Gillum, a Democratic candidate for governor, for governor endorsed by Senator Bernie Sanders, has campaigned in favor of Amendment 4 as part of his advocacy for criminal justice reform calling it a step in the right direction and criticize the existing process as arbitrary and capricious. This governor, this cabinet have had no shame around that. It resulted in the disenfranchising of an entire group of people just because they feel like it. Gillum told ABC News, yo, Gillum may never lie. That's the only reason, yo. Just because they feel like they're white and they can do what they want to anybody who's not. Or they can do anything they want for anybody who is. Jeremy Ring, the presumptive Democratic nominee for Chief Financial Officer, one of the four positions that sits on the Board of Clemency, has railed against Republicans for using nonviolent felon voting rights as a political tool. I don't know what's the number, what's the number of nonviolent ex-felons who would vote, but it could swing the election against Governor Scott, and that's what he and his team sees. Ring said in an interview with ABC News, the nonviolent the non ex-felons who want to get their rights restored are collateral damage to a Republican who wants to win a United States Senate seat. Try to tell ya, man. Scott's administration has been the subject of multiple lawsuits regarding the state's handling of voting rights issues. A group of felons whose clemency requests were rejected or have outstanding cases sued to challenge the clemency system on the grounds that the arbitrary decisions violate protections on the right to vote. A district court judge sided with the felons in April, criticizing Scott for a seemingly arbitrary rationale for granting clemency. In Florida, elected partisan officials have extraordinary authority to grant or withhold the right to vote from hundreds of thousands of people without any constraints, guidelines, or standards. District Court Judge Mark Walker wrote in an April ruling order in Scott to create a new process to restore felons' voting rights. The question now is whether such a system passes constitutional muster. It does not. A three-judge three panel on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals overruled Walker and sided with the state, granting a, a, a stay preventing changes to the clemency system. The legal fight over the clemency board is still in, prog in, in progress. Florida historically has been one of the worst states for restoring for voting rights in America, says John Sherman, senior counsel at the Fair Elections Legal Network and lead counsel on the lawsuit challenging the clemency system. Sherman told ABC News he sees the potential for the system to be leveraged politically, but that the issue goes further than any political party. I couldn't say what the reason is for why certain political actors do this. Black and white is still their racial line in America. And Obama's rise just perpetuated all of them to be extra, extra scared because if one black man can become president after 42 other men had been president and they were all white, it's going to be a lot more of them that could end up being president. We can't have that. I couldn't say what the reason is for why certain political actors do this. They obviously think it's to their advantage, 
but for us the only thing that matters is that people of all parties are able to vote. This hurts Democrats, Republicans, Independents, Libertarians, everyone, Sherman said. Sherman, I know you're trying to be politically correct, but you know, it hurts Democrats more than it hurts everybody. Right? Courts have stymied the state's previous efforts to regulate voting rights. The, the state has lost court challenges in the last three years on decisions to not extend early voting days in 2016 after Hurricane Matthew, not allowing university buildings to be used as polling places, and a rule that allowed election officials to, to throw out absentee ballots based on matching signatures to those in the poll book. These are like 1940s, 50s, 60s tactics, yo. <laughs> Scott has defended his record on voting, however, claiming despite the legal challenges that Florida is a top state for, for voting access, pointing to a 2013 law that he signed expanding early voting. Under the governor's leadership, Florida has become one of the most voter-friendly states in the nation. John Tubbs, Scott's spokes spokesperson, said in a statement to ABC News. This includes landmark legislation signed by the governor in 2013 that give Floridians more voting days, hours, and sites so they can have plenty of options to vote. Hey, take advantage of that law if they are right. The 2013 legislation did expand the number of early voting days, but it was Scott's administration that in the 2014 advisory opinion from the Florida Department of State's Division of Election decided to not allow university buildings to be used as early voting sites. I'm, I'm going to tell you now why they don't want to use university buildings, right? Guess what? I, take, take a wild guess college students college students you will literally have more voters because they will have time to vote they will be on campus they know where, where the food place is they know where the bathrooms are they know where everything and they don't have to go too far instead of having them go out to go vote you can bring the voting to them you know what I mean it's a, it's a smart idea it's a smart idea you already have voting uh, bingo halls and citizens and, uh, and senior citizen centers and VA halls and, and VFW halls and shit. So why not university campuses? You know, they do have room. They have plenty of room. That they, they, there's no shortage of room on university campuses. Trust and believe. The 2013 legislation did expand the number of early voting days, but it was Scott's administration that in 2014, a year later, in the 2014 advisory opinion from the Florida Department of State's Division of Election, decided not to allow university buildings to be used as early voting sites. On clemency, Scott has also cons consistently emphasized his opposition to the efforts challenging his power as the court case has unfolded. Framing it as an issue of ensuring justice for victims of crimes committed by felons. The governor will always stand with victims of crimes. Now, now they're trying to make him out to be a tough on crime law, law and order governor. You know what I mean? I, I get it, but here's where that argument is bullshit. Because the victims of the crime are not going to be affected by that vote. That criminal who have paid their debt to society is gonna cast. You get it? How the argument is bullshit. The whole argument I say the governor will always stand with victims of crime. They trying to that's why Trump Trump said during doing doing the doing the, the debates now with Hillary that he was gonna be the law and order president. He used that word law and order because the 50, 60, 70 year old white men and women who went out and vote, who go out and vote. And by the way, people 18 to 24, we about to outnumber people 50 and older. Yeah, so it's in your best interest if you're between 18 and 24 to go out and vote and start voting out and continue on. You know what I mean? That's what I said, like, they, they, they these racially coded, coded words and phrasing that's been ingrained 
in the xenophobic psyche for generations. A 50, 60, 70 year old cannot be convinced of anything. Just like Mandela was saying that it was interesting that a young man was able to fit in with this old man who was stuck in their ways. I can never convince a 60 year old Trump supporter that Obama was, was good for him who was making less than who was getting, who was depending on Social Security or Medicare. That 60 some year old white man who, who, who donned that hat and said, yes, we're going to make America great again. And, and he went out and voted for Trump. I could not convince him that Obama was better for him than Trump would ever be. Because in his mind, that black man as leader couldn't do nothing right for him as a white man in America. I cannot convince him of that. But between age of eight, 18 and 24 though, if you 18 and, between 18 and 24 right now in America, right now, there's, there's been a generation of That's why this time is so pivotal. You are quite literally living the lives of a historic generation who will have something to say. Yo, you are quite literally in a position so all pun intended, Trump, the, the accomplishment of the baby boomers. They are the greatest generation, hands down. Right now, according to history, they are the greatest generation. Because we've had six of the last eight presidents with baby boomers. Or maybe five of the last seven presidents of baby boomers, you know what I mean? Your generation right now, that 18 to 24 core, who should go out and vote in troves right now? That same core who 60 years ago was so impactful. You're living in historic times if you of that age bracket. You know what I mean? Like, just, just focus on that age bracket right there. That's why they're refusing to allow voting, especially the early voting on the university buildings. Because here is their thought process. And their thought process is jacked up, mind you. The way they see you guys are so consumed with school right now that the only way you guys can have time to, to cash your ballot is if you have more days on site on campus for to vote early and to and, and before election day comes around. Because if you guys have time, you can schedule it around your class schedule. You know, like it, it's this is a generational battle of wanting to keep white privilege and white supremacy alive and kicking. That's what I'm hopping on. But I digress. The governor will always stand with victims of crime, Tuff said in the May statement. He believes that people who have been convicted of crime like murder, violence against children, and domestic violence should demonstrate that they can live, in a, life, live a life free of crime while being accountable to our communities. You're right, Tuffs. You're right. That's why they said non-violent ex-felons. We're not talking about like that. Although the, the advocacy in opposition to the ballots question on the restoring felon voting rights has been limited, some conservatives have argued against granting these rights automatically and their states should have the right to develop their own processes. I just think it's not a good thing to do it automatically and I think it's okay for states to say, for example, we want, we want to have a waiting period. Hans von Spakowski, wow. Yeah. You're one of those xenophobic implanted immigrants. A senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation told ABC News, and motherfuckers. I don't think there's a problem with having a, f a, a review process for a state to make sure that you have turned over a new leaf. Vance Pakavsvi added, I don't think so either, but it shouldn't come down to the governor having to decide, having to, to, have, having to want to hear somebody facing the clemency board tell him that, oh, I, 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 want, to, I want you to restore my wife for, to vote because I will vote for you, for him to have it restored. Scott has actively embraced his power to develop his own process, explaining his own views, view of clemency in a December 2016 Board of Clemency hearing. There is no standard, Scott said. We can do whatever we want. 
For Galasso, however, the issue has less to do with any political issue, more than creating a path for those people who make a similar mistake to his. On the day my rights are restored, Galasso said, that means there is hope for the many, many, many others who come behind me. I, I, I just, I just noticed something about what Rick Scott said in December 2016, and I, I'm thinking about it. He said there is no standard. We can do whatever we want. Do you know why specifically he said that in November 2016? He was feeling that euphoric wave of the Republican Congress coming in and, and dumb Trump being president. At that point, they were all in their head. They were like, oh yeah, this nigga out. This nigga gone. We got this shit back. We can do whatever the fuck we want. They're still thinking like that. And the only way they can not do whatever the fuck they want is if enough people go out and go vote Democratic. Oh, my bad. I shouldn't have said that. Okay, if more people go and go vote now Republican, how's that? That's better? Turn your lights down. So, Mr. Rohilala Mandela. We were permitted a fairly wide range of newspapers and magazines and could receive such previously contraband publications as Time Magazine and The Guardian Weekly from London. This gave us a window on the wider world. We also had a radio, but one that received only local stations and not what we really wanted, the BBC World Service. We were allowed out on our terrace all day long, except between 12 and 2 when the warders had their lunch. There were not even a pretense that we had to walk. I had a small cell near our large one that functioned as a study, with a chair, desk and bookshelves, where I could read and write during the day. On Robin Island, I would do my exercises in my own cramped cell, but now I had room to stretch out. At Poolsmore, I would wake up at 5 and do an hour and a half of exercise in our communal cell. I followed my usual regimen of stationary running, skipping, sit-ups, fingertips, push-ups. My comrades were not early risers, and my program soon made me a very un unpopular fellow in our cell. Still got a better record than his brother John. Yeah. The hundred dollar million, man. The dollar, dollar, dollar bill, man. I was visited by Winnie shortly after arriving at Poosmore and was pleased to find that the visiting area was far better and more modern than the one at Robin Island. We had a large glass barrier through which one could see the visitor from the waist up and far more sophisticated microphones so that we did not have to strain to hear. The window gave at least the illusion of greater intimacy, and in prison, illusions can offer comfort. It was far easier for my wife and my family to get to Poolsmore than to Robin Island, and this made a tremendous difference. The supervision of visits also became more humane. Often, Winnie's visits were overseen by Warren's officer, James Gregory, who had been a censor on Robin Island. I had not known him terribly well, but he knew us because he had been responsible for reviewing our incoming and outgoing mail. At Poolsmore, I got to know Gregory better and found him a welcome contrast 
to the typical water. He was polished and self-spoken and treated Winnie with courtesy and deference. Instead of barking times up, he would say, Mrs. Mandela, you have five more minutes. The Bible tells us that gardens preceded gardeners, but that was not the case at Pusmo, where I cultivated a garden that became one of my happiest diversions. It was my way of escaping from the monolithic concrete wall that surrounded us. Within a few weeks of surveying all the empty space that had, we had on, on the building's roof and how it was bathed in sun the whole day, I decided to, to start a garden and receive permission to do so from the commanding officer. I requested that the prison service supply me with, with 16, with 16 40, 44 gallon oil drums that they sliced in half for me. The authorities then filled each, each half with rich, moist soil, creating in effect 32 giant flower pots. I grew onions, aubergines, cabbage, cauliflower, beans, spinach, carrots, cucumbers, broccoli, beetroot, lettuce, tomatoes, peppers, strawberries, and much more. At its height, I had a small farm with nearly 900 plants, a, gardener, a, a, a garden far grander than the one I had on Robin Island. Some of the seeds I purchased and some, for example, broccoli and carrots were given to me by the commanding officer, Brigadier Munro, who was particularly fond of these vegetables. Warders also gave me seeds of vegetables they liked and I was, and I was supplied with excellent manure to use as fertilizer. Each morning I put on a straw hat and, and rough gloves and walked in the garden for two hours. Every Sunday I would supply vegetables to the kitchen so that they would cook a special meal for the common law prisoners. I also gave quite a lot of my harvest to the warders who used to bring satchels to take away their fresh vegetables. At Pusmo, our problems tended to be less consequential than those we experienced on Robin Island. Brigadier Munro was a decent, helpful man who took extra pains to make sure we had what we wanted. Nevertheless, small problems sometimes got blown, out, way out, blown up out of proportion. In 1983, during a visit from Winnie and, and Zinzi, I mentioned to my wife that I had been given shoes that were a size too small and were pinching my toe. Winnie was concerned and I soon learned that there were press reports that I was having a toe amputated. Yo, you know what's so funny about that? Yeah? When Mandela was sick, when, when he was rushed to the hospital in July of 2013, a year, a year, the year before you were born, J. Ba, when he was rushed to the hospital, he was experiencing complications from he was he had an infection in his lung. He had a lung infection. He was rushed into the into the hospital. It was so much rumored speculation coming out of South Africa that the man had already died. They were just trying to keep it secret. They were keeping him on life support like that. It was wow. And I don't. I think Obama visited Africa around that time and made a stop. He made a stop in South Africa and went and, and went and saw the man. I'm, if I, I'm, I'm not sure. I can't remember exactly, but I can't remember the Obama part of stoppage. But when Mandela was rushed to the hospital in July of 2013, that was crazy, man. Everybody was just like. Winnie was concerned, and I soon learned that there were press reports that I was having a toe amputated. Because of the difficulty of communication, information from prison often became exaggerated in the outside world. If I had simply been able to telephone my wife and tell her that my food was fine, such confusion would not have happened. A short while later, Helen Sussman was permitted to visit, and she inquired about my toe. I thought the best answer was a demonstration. I took off my, my socks, held up my bare foot up to the glass, and wiggled my toes. We complained about the dampness in our cell, which was causing us to catch colds. Later, I heard reports that South African newspapers were writing that our, cells, our cell was flooded. We asked for contact with other prisons and in general made the same basic complaints that we always had, to be treated as political prisoners. In May 1984, 
I was a zygote. I was either a zygote or an embryo. I was one or two, but I was on my way to becoming. I was on my way to December 1984, to being introduced to this beautiful, white-dominated, supremacist world. Hmm. In May 1984, I found some consolation that seemed to wake up for all the, to make up for all the, the discomfort. On a scheduled visit from Winnie, Zenny and her, and her youngest daughter, I was escorted by one officer Gregory who, instead of taking me to the normal visiting area, ushered me into a separate room where, they had, where there was only a small table and no dividers of any kind. He very softly said to me that the authorities had made a change. That day was the beginning of what was to be known as contact visits. He then went outside to see my wife and daughter and, and asked to speak to Winnie privately. Winnie actually got a fight when Gregory took her aside, thinking that I was perhaps healed. But Gregory escorted her around the door, and before either of us knew it, we were in the same room and in each other's arms. I kissed and held my wife for the first time in all, in all, in, in all these many years. It was a moment I had dreamed about a thousand times. It was as if I was still dreaming. I held, her for, I held her to me for what seemed like an eternity. We were still in silence except for the sounds of our hearts. I did not want to let go of her at all, but I broke free and embraced my daughter and then took her child onto my lap. It had been 21 years since I had even touched my wife's hand. Chapter 88. At Postmore, we were more connected to outside events. We were aware that the struggle was intensifying and that the efforts of the enemy were similarly increasing. In 1981, the South African Defense Force launched a, ra a raid on ANC offices in Maputo, Mozambique, killing 13 of our people, including, including women and children. In December 1982, MK set off, MK set off explosions at the unfinished Koiborg nuclear plant power plants outside Cape Town and placed bombs and many other military and apartheid tar targets around the country. The same, that same month, the South African military again, again attacked an ANC outpost in Maseru Lesotho, killing 42 people, including a dozen women and children. In August 1982, the activist Ruth Faust was opening her post in Maputo where she was living in exile when she was murdered by a letter bomb. Ruth, the wife of Joe Slovo, was a brave anti-apartheid activist who had spent a number of months in, in prison. She was a forceful, engaging woman who I first met when I was studying her wit, and her death revealed the extent of the state's cruelty in combating our struggle. MK's first car bomb took place in May 1983 and was aimed at an Air Force and military intelligence office in the heart of Pretoria. This was an effort to retaliate for the unprovoked attacks the military had launched on the ANC in Maseru and elsewhere and was a clear escalation of the armed struggle. 19 people were killed and more than 200 injured. The killing, the killing of citizens was a tragic accident, and I felt a profound horror at the death toll. But disturbed as I was by these casualties, I felt that such accidents were the inevitable consequence of the decision to embark on a military struggle. Human fallibility is always a part of war, and the price of it is always high. It is precisely because we knew that such incidents would occur that our decision to take up harms had been so grave and reluctant. But as Oliver said at the time of the bombing, the armed struggle was imposed upon us by the violence of the apartheid regime. Both the governments and the ANCs were looking on two tracks, military and political. On the political front, the government was pursuing its standard divide and rule strategy in attempting to separate Africans from coloreds and Indians. In a referendum in, in November 1983, the white electorate endorsed P.W. Botha's plan to create a so-called tricameral parliament with Indian and colored chambers in addition to the white parliament. This was an effort to lure Indians and coloreds into the system and divide them from Africans. 
but the offer was merely a toy telephone. As all, as all parliamentary actions by Indians and colors are subject to a white veto. It, it is also a way of fooling the outside world into thinking that the government was reforming apartheid. Voters' rights did not deceive, voters' rules did not deceive the people. As more than 80% of eligible Indian and colored voters boycotted the election to the new houses of parliament in 1984. Powerful grassroots political movements were being formed inside the country that had firm links to the ANC, the principal one being the United Democratic Fund, of which I was named a patron. The UDF had been created to coordinate protests against the new apartheid constitution in 1983 and the first election to the segregated tricameral parliament in 1984. The UDF soon blossomed into a powerful organization that united over 600 anti-apartheid organizations, trade unions, community groups, church groups, student associations. The ANC was experiencing a new birth of popularity. Poll, opinion polls showed that the Congress was far and away the most popular political organization among Africans, even though it had been banned for a quarter of a century. The anti-apartheid struggle as a whole had captured the attention of the world. In 1984, Desmond, Bishop Desmond Tutu was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. That's why Trump could never get that. Because that prize has gone to people such as Archbishop Desmond Tutu. In the year I was born, the greatest year in the year of years, so great a book was named for it. You know, I'm just saying. The authorities refused, refused to send Bishop Tutu my letter of congratulations. The South African government was under growing international pressure as, as nations all across the globe began to impose economic sanctions on Pretoria. The government has sent feelers to me over the years, beginning with Minister Kruger's efforts to persuade me to move to the Transki. Those were not efforts to negotiate but attempts to isolate me from my organization. On several other occasions, Kruger said to me, Mandela, we can work with you but not your colleagues. Be reasonable. Although I did not respond to these overtures, the mere fact that they were talking rather than attacking could be seen as a prelude to genuine negotiations. The government was testing the waters. In late 1984 and early 1985, I had visits from, visit from two prominent Western statesmen, Lord Nicholas Bethel, a member of the British House of Lords and the European Parliament, and Samuel Dash, a professor of law at Georgetown University and a former counsel to the U.S. Senate Watergate Committee. Both visits were authorized by the new Minister of Justice, Kobe Coetzee, who appeared to be a new sort of African leader. I met Lord Bethel in the prison commander's office, which was dominated by a large photograph of a glowing President Butter. Beto was a jovial, rotund man, and when I first met him, I teased him about his stoutness. You look as though you are related to Winston Churchill, I said as, he, as we shook hands, and he laughed. Lord Beto wanted to know about our conditions at Pusmo, and I told him. We discussed the armed struggle, and I explained to him that it was not up to us to renounce violence for the government. I reaffirmed that we, we, aim, we, aim, we aim for hard military target, not people. I would not use our message, for instance, the Major here, I said, pointing to Major Fritz Van Sitter, who was monitoring the talks. Van Sitter was a good-natured fellow who, who did not say much, but he, but he, but he started um, at my remark. In my, visit from, in my visit from Professor Dash, which quickly followed that, that of, of Lord Bethel, I laid out what I saw as the minimum for a future non-racial South Africa. A unitary state without homelands. 
non-racial elections for the central parliament and one person one vote. Professor Dash asked me whether I looked I, I took any encouragement from the government's stated intention of repealing the mixed marriage laws and the certain other apartheid statuses. This is a pinprick, I said. This is not my ambition. It is not my ambition to marry a white woman or to swim or to swim in a white pool. It is a political equality that we want. I told Dash quite kindly at the moment we could not defeat the government on the battlefield, but could make governing difficult for them. I had one not so pleasant visit from two Americans. Now, this was a time when Dick Cheney's, Dick Cheney had had all the risen to prominence under, under Richard Nixon already, and Nixon had already resigned and dealt with all that. So this was the time Dick Cheney was all gung ho about when Dick Cheney was calling Mandela a terrorist, when he was all gung ho about American businesses not divesting from apartheid league businesses. I had one not so pleasant visit from two Americans, editors of the Republican newspaper, the Washington Times. They seemed less intent on finding out my views than on proving that I was a communist and a terrorist. All these questions were slanted in all their questions were slanted in their directions. And when I and when I reiterated that I was neither a communist nor a terrorist, they attempted to show that I was not a Christian either by asserting that the Reverend Martin Luther King never resorted to violence. <laughs> They try to pull the same white boy move. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm tired, man. I, I just did an eight and a half hour shift. And yeah. Now I'm trying to finish this up. I'm trying to finish it. I'm trying to put this out on October 9th, my job day. But it doesn't look likely. If I do put it out there, there wouldn't be a hundred hours as how as I would like. But I don't know. Let's see. I digress. Though. I had one not so pleasant visit from two Americans, editors editors of the Republican newspaper, the Washington Times. They seemed less intent on finding out my views than on proving that I was a communist and a terrorist. All their questions were slanted in their directions. And when I reiterated that I was neither a communist nor a terrorist, they attempted to show that I was not a Christian either by asserting that Reverend Martin Luther King never resorted to violence. I told them that the conditions in which Martin Luther King struggled were totally different from my own. The United States was a democracy with constitutional guarantees of equal rights that protected non-violent protests though there are still prejudice against blacks. South Africa was a police state with a constitution that enshrined inequality and an army that responded to nonviolence with force. I told him that I was a Christian and had always been a Christian. Even Christ, has, even Christ I said, when he was left with no alternative, used force to expel the money lenders from the temple. He was not a man of violence but he had no choice but to use force against evil. I do not think I persuaded him. No, you didn't. She was a lost cause. They had already made up their mind before they even met you. But you knew that, but you knew that Don Nelson, so he, he knew that. Faced with trouble at home and pressure from abroad, P.W. Butter offered a tepid halfway measure. On January 31st, 1985, your daddy was almost two months old. I was two months old. I was almost two months old. I was like six weeks old. On 31st January 1985, in a debate in, in Parliament, the state president publicly offered me my freedom if I unconstitutionally rejected violence as a political instrument. 
This offer was extended to all political prisoners. Then, as though he was taking me to a public challenge, he added, It is therefore not the South African government which now stands in the way of Mr. Mandela's freedom. It is he himself. I had been warned by the authorities that the government was going to make a proposal in involving my freedom, but I had not been prepared for the fact that it would be made in parliament by the state president. By my reckoning, it was the sixth conditional offer the government has made for my release in the past 10 years. After I listened to the speech on the radio, I made a request to the commander of the prison for an urgent visit by my wife and my lawyer, Ismail Ayob so that I will dictate my response to the state president's offer. Winnie and Ishmael were not given permission to visit for a week, and, and in the meantime, I wrote a letter to the foreign minister, Pick Botha, rejecting the conditions for my release, while also preparing a public response. I was keen to do a number of things in this response, because Botha's offer was an attempt to drive a wedge between me and my colleagues by, by tempting me to accept a policy the ANC rejected. See, that's a smart black man making a smart move right there. Like, that Botha offer is like, this, it's like Trump moves talking about Mexicans are rapists and murderers and we're going to build a wall. You know what I mean? Like, as soon as he said that, he just <sighs> fucked everything up. Fucked everything up. This motherfucker right here, man. I was keen to do a number of things in this response because Botha's offer was an attempt to drive a wedge between me and my colleagues by tempting me to accept a policy the ANC rejected. I wanted to reassure the ANC in general and Oliver Tambo in particular that my loyalty to the organization was beyond question. I also wish to send a message to the government that while I rejected this offer because of the conditions attached to it, I, I nevertheless thought negotiation, not war, was the path to a solution. Both wanted the honors of violence to rest on my shoulders, and I wanted to reaffirm to the world that we were only responding to the violence done to us. I intended to make it clear that if I emerged from prison into the same circumstances under which I was arrested, I would be forced to resume the same activities for which I was arrested. I mean, it's only right. I met Winnie and Ishmael on a Friday. On Sunday, a UDF rally was to be held in Soweto's Jabulani Stadium, where my response would be made public. Some guards with whom I was not familiar supervised the visit. And as we began discussing my response to the state president, one of the warders, a relatively young fellow, interrupted to say that only family matters were permitted to be discussed. See? You, you see the difference between the older warden who was judging this man based on the character of his skin and not just and this young idiot who at that time he was probably being infused with all the same kind of anti, the same kind of pro apartheid propaganda in South Africa then that white racists were going through with the Fox News propaganda during Obama's presidency. I ignored him and he returned minutes later with a senior warder whom I barely knew. This warder said that I must cease discussing politics. And I told him that I was dealing with a matter of national importance involving an offer from the state president. I warned him that if he wanted to hold the discussion, he must get direct order from the state president himself. If you are not willing to telephone the state president to get those orders, I said coldly, then kindly do not interrupt us again. He did not. I gave Ishmael and Winnie the speech I had prepared. In addition to responding to the government, I wanted to thank publicly the UDF for its fine work and to congratulate Archbishop Tutu on his prize, adding that his award belonged to all the people. On Sunday, 10 February 1985, my daughter Zinzi read my response to a cheering crowd of people who had not been able to hear my words legally anywhere in South Africa for more than 20 years. Zinzi was a dynamic speaker like her mother and said that her father should be at the stadium to speak the words himself. I was proud to know that it was she who spoke my words.
I am a member of the National African Congress. I have always been a member of the African National Congress and I will remain a member of the African National Congress until the day I die. Oliver Tambo is more than a brother to me. He is my greatest friend and comrade for nearly 50 years. If there is anyone amongst you who cherishes my freedom, Oliver Tambo cherishes it more. And I know that he will give his life to see me free. I am surprised at the conditions that the government wants to impose on me. I am not a violent man. It was only then when all other forms of resistance were no longer open to us that we turned to arm struggle. Let Bota show that he is different to Milan, Stridom, and Valvord. Let him renounce violence. Let him say that he will dismantle apartheid. Let him unband the People's Organization, the African National Congress. Let him free all who have been in prison, banished or exiled for their opposition to apartheid. Let him guarantee free political activity so that people may decide who will govern them. I cherish my own freedom dearly, but I care even more for your freedom. Too many have died since I went to prison. Too many have died for the love of freedom. I owe it to their widows, to their orphans, to their mothers, and to their fathers who have grieved and wept for them. Not only I have suffered during these long, lonely, wasted years, I am not less life-loving than you are, but I cannot sell my birthrights, nor am I prepared to sell the birthrights of the people to be free. What freedom am I being offered while the organization of the population remains banned? What freedom am I being offered when I, I may be arrested on a on a past offense? What freedom am I being offered to live my life as a family with my dear wife who remains in banishment in Brantford? What freedom am I being offered when I must ask for permission to live in an urban area? What freedom am I being offered when my very South African citizenship is now respected? Only free men can negotiate. Prisoners cannot enter into contract. I cannot and will not give any undertaking at a time when I and you, the people, are not free. Your freedom and mine cannot be separated. I will return. That man can write. In 1985, after a routine medical examination from the prison doctor, I was referred to a urologist who diagnosed an enlarged prostate gland and recommended surgery. He said the procedure was routine. I consulted with my family and decided to go ahead with the operation. I was taken to Volks Hospital in Cape Town under heavy security. Winnie flew down and was able to see me prior to the surgery. But I had another visitor, a surprising and unexpected one. Kobe Koetsi, the Minister of Justice. Not long before, I had written to Koetsi pressing him for a meeting to discuss talks between the ANC and the government. He did not respond, but that morning he dropped by the hospital unannounced as if he were visiting an old friend who was laid up for a few days. He was altogether gracious and cordial, and for the most part we simply made pleasantries. Though I acted as though this was the most normal thing in the world, I was amazed. The government, in its slow and tentative way, was reckoning that they had to come to some accommodation with the ANCs. Coetti's visit was an olive branch. Though we did not discuss politics, I did bring up one sensitive issue, and that was the status of my wife. In August, shortly before I entered hospital, Winnie had gone to Johannesburg to receive medical treatment. The only trip she was permitted, the only trip she was permitted from Brantford, were to visit either me or her doctor. While in Johannesburg, her house in Brantford and the clinic behind it were firebombed and destroyed. Winnie had no place in which to reside, and she decided to remain in Johannesburg despite the fact that the city was off limits to her. Nothing happened for a few weeks, and then the security police wrote to inform her that the house in Brantford had been re repaired and she must return, but she refused to do so. I asked Coetzee to allow Winnie to remain in Johannesburg and not to force her to return to Brantford. I said, he said he, he, could, he could promise nothing, but he would indeed look into it. I thank him. 
I spent several days in hospital recuperating from the surgery. When I was discharged, I was collected from the hospital by Brigadier Munro. Commanding officers do not usually pick up prisoners from hospitals, so my suspicions were immediately aroused. On the ride back, Brigadier Munro said to me in a casual way, as though he was simply making conversation, Mandela, you are not, we are not taking you back to your friends now. I asked him what he meant. From now on, you are going to be alone. I asked him why. He shook his head. I don't know. I've just been given these instructions from headquarters. Once again, there was no warning and no explanation. Upon my return to Pusmo, I was taken to a new cell on the ground floor of the prison, three floors below and in, in, in an entirely different wing. I was given three rooms and a separate toilet, with one room to be used for sleeping, one across the hall for studying, and another for exercise. By prison standards, this was palatial, but the doors were, where the rooms were damp and musty and received very little natural light. I said nothing to, to the brigadier, for I knew the decision had not been his. I wanted time to consider the implications of the move. Why had the state taken this step? It would be too strong to call it a revelation, but over the next few days and weeks, I came to a, re to a re re realization about my new circumstances. The change I decided was not a liability, but an opportunity. I was not happy to be separated from my colleagues and I missed my garden and the sunny terrace on the third floor. But my solitude gave me a certain liberty and I resolved to use it to do something I had been pondering for a long time, begin discussions with the government. I had concluded that the time had come when the struggle could best be pushed forward through negotiations. If we did not start a dialogue soon, both sides will, will soon be plunged into a dark night of oppression, violence and war. My solitude will give me an opportunity to take the first steps in that direction, without the kind of scrutiny that might destroy such effort. We had been fighting against white minority rule for three quarters of a century. We had been engaged. Whew. Man. That is some shit, yo. Can you imagine being born into your own country in Africa and being told that you don't have the basic rights that somebody else who wasn't... We had been fighting against white minority rule for three quarters of a century. We had been engaged in the armed struggle for more than two decades. Many people on both sides have already died. The enemy was strong and resolute, yet even with all their bombers and tanks, they must have sensed they were on the wrong side of history. We had right on our side, but not yet might. That was an awesome line. We had right on our side, but not yet might. It's an awesome line. Oh, darling, darling, I'm calling, calling. It was clear to me that a, that a military victory was a distant, if not impossible, dream. It simply did not make sense for both sides to lose thousands, if not millions of lives in a conflict that was unnecessary. They must have known this as well. It was time to talk. This would be ex extremely sensitive. Both sides, regarded, both sides regarded discussions as a sign of weakness and betrayal. Neither will come to the table unless the other made significant concessions. The government asserted over and over that we were a terrorist organization of communists and that they would never, that, that they would never talk to terrorists or communists. This was national party dogma. The ANC asserted over and over that the, that the government was, was fascistic and racist and that there was nothing to talk about until they unbanned the ANC unconstitutionally release all political prisoners and remove the troops from the townships. A decision to talk to the government was as of such importance that it should only have been made in Lusaka. But I felt that the process needed to begin and I had neither the time nor the means to communicate fully with Oliver. Someone from our side needed to take the first step and my new isolation gave me both the freedom to do so and the assurance at least for a while of the confidentiality of my efforts. I was now in a kind of splendid isolation, 
though my colleagues were only three floors above me, they might as well have been in Johannesburg. In order to see, to see them, I had to put in a formal request for a visit, which had to be approved by the head office in Pretoria. It often took weeks to receive a response. If it was approved, I would then meet with them in the visiting area. This was a novel experience. My comrades and fellow prisoners were now official visitors. For years, we had been able to talk for hours a day. Now we had to make official requests and appointments, and our conversations were monitored. After I had been in my new cell for a few days, I asked the commanding officer to arrange such a meeting. He did so, and the four of us discussed the issue of my transfer. my track right here. So, and he did so, and the four of us discussed the issue of my transfer. Walter, Kathy, and Ray were angry that we had been separated. They wanted to lodge a strong protest and demand that we be, re we be reunited. My response was not what they expected. Look, Taps, I said. I don't think we should oppose this thing. I mentioned that my new accommodation was superior, and maybe this would set a precedence for all political prisoners. I then added somewhat ambiguously, perhaps something good will come of this. I'm now in a position where the government can make an approach to us. They did not care too much for this latter explanation as I knew they would not. I choose to tell no one what I was about to do, not my colleagues or upstairs, not those in Lusaka. The ANC is a collective, but the government had made collectivity in this case impossible. I did, I did not have the security or the time to discuss these issues with my organization. I knew that my colleagues upstairs would condemn my proposal, and that would kill my initiative even before it was born. There were times when a leader must move out ahead of the flock, go off in a new direction, confidence that he is leading his people the right way. Finally, my isolation furnished my organization with an excuse in case matters went awry. The old man was alone and completely cut off, and his actions were taken by him as an individual, not a representative of the ANC. Chapter 90. Within a few weeks of my move, I wrote to Kobe Koesi to propose talks about talks. As before, I received no response. I wrote once more, and again there was no response. I found this peculiar and demoralizing, and I realized I had to look for another opportunity to be heard. This came in early 1986. Hey. General, let me tell you this, this little story, right? You, I, I don't know. I don't know how often you, you go to the pharmacy and, 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 and go see and go see your barbain, so your grandpa and all that. But so your grandfather told me this story back that night, back in May of 2013, when Chelal was 25 years old. He told me this when, when we were able to put together the calendar for the 25th year's anniversary and all that good stuff, you know what I mean? So, and we also had an ad in the paper thanking all our customers for the last 25 years, which was awesome. Long story short though, he told me how, what was his inspiration, his motivation for, for opening a pharmacy, you know what I mean? Because that, that wasn't a, a business he was even thinking about getting into. Back in 86, he said, one of your aunties 
Bente. Well, one of your aunties was sick, supposedly she was real, real sick, and, and it was a Saturday, and they had taken her to the hospital, and, and they needed a couple of IV bags. But the IV bags they needed, the hospital did not have. Like, Sierra Leone, hospitals in Sierra Leone, shit whole countries don't have medical supplies in their hospitals. The only hospital, you, you the patient, have to get family to go buy the supplies at the pharmacy and bring it to you at the hospital, and give it to the hospital staff for them to perform the procedure they need to perform on you. So, yeah. It's still the same like that today, but in 86 though, imagine she was even worse. So, the grandfather said that, and he, your aunt was real, real sick, and they told him they needed a few IV bags, and he said they went out looking for pharmacies that were open that day to, to buy the IV bags and the supplies that they needed. So, they roamed around the city, drove around the city, found, could not find nothing. Mind you now, this was in 1986, you know what I mean? 1986, the, the pharmacy was open in 88, but the, the motivating event happened two years prior. So, they went around, they went around, they could not find it anywhere, but this one small little pharmacy out in Carberton somewhere, like that, that far out from, from the city. Like they went all the way out there. And when they went out there, and your grandfather was somebody at that time, even in the 80s, he, he had been blessed with the opportunity to travel outside of Africa, not just outside of Sierra Leone, to see other parts of the world, to realize what it means to have a standard of quality. Your, your grandfather was always one who, who, who preferred quality over quantity any day of the week, you know what I mean? Like, that's just who, who he is, and he's absolutely right. That's how it's supposed to be. So, the pharmacy they found, they asked for the IV bags they needed, and lo and behold, they, they had it. But instead of having it stored and shelved in like a regular shelf, whether it's a cabinet, whether it's a shelf, instead of having it properly stored, they had, they reached into an empty sack of rice, that's where they were storing the, the, the IV bags, the normal selling bags and all that. And granted, everything, the, the actual medication is sealed in the IV bag, but just like, the person your grandfather was and is to this day, that just didn't sit well with him, you know what I mean? Because if he has to drive that far just to get a simple IV bag that far away from the hospital, and to come to finding a place where they're storing it in a rice bag, like, come on now, something ain't right. So that was just a motivating factor in getting it. So I just had to. And two years later, Chelal Pharmacy was born. Awesome source. Actually, actually, actually hope, actually hope you get the opportunity to spend as much time around your grandfather as you can, yo. Just I and, and I hope he's he's more welcoming to having kids at the store, at the shop than, than he used to be back then in Army, because you know. Yeah, he, he, he ain't really uh, the biggest advocate of having kids come to the shop with him. So. <clears throat> I found this peculiar and demoralizing. I realized I had to look for another opportunity to be heard. This came in early 1986. At a meeting of the British Commonwealth in NASA in October 1985, the leaders could not reach agreement on whether to participate in international sanctions against South Africa. This was mainly because British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher was adamantly opposed. To resolve the deadlock, the assembled nations agreed that a delegation of eminent persons will visit South Africa and report back on whether sanctions were the appropriate tool to help bring about the end of apartheid. In early 1986, the several-member eminent persons group, led by General Olusenju Obasanjo, whoo, that Nigerian right there, the former military leader of Nigeria and the former Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser arrived in South Africa on their fact-finding mission. 
In February, I was visited by General Obasanjo to discuss the nature of, of the delegate's brief. He was eager to facilitate a meeting between me and the full group. With the government's permission, such a meeting was, was scheduled for May. The group will be, t will be talking with the cabinet after they had seen me, and I viewed this as a chance to raise the subject of negotiations. The government regarded my session with the group as something extraordinary. Two days before, before the, the meeting, I was visited by Brigitte, Brigitte Munro, who had brought along a tailor. Mandela, the commander said, we want you to see these people on an equal footing. We don't want you to wear those old prison clothes. So this tailor will take, will take your measurements and outfit you with a proper suit. The tailor must have been some kind of wizard. For the very next day, I tried on a pinstripe suit that fitted me like a glove. I was also given a shirt, tie, socks, shoes, and underwear. The commander admired my new attire. Mandela, you look like a prime minister now, not a prisoner, he said and smiled. At the meeting between me and the eminent persons group, we were joined by two significant observers. Kobe Kowetsi and Lieutenant General W.H. Williamsi, the Commissioner of Prisons. Like the tailor, these two men were there to take my measure. But curiously, they left shortly after the session started. I pressed them to remain, but I, 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 saying I had nothing to hide. But they left anyway. Before they took their leave, I told them the time had come for negotiations, not fighting, and that the government and the ANC should sit down and talk. The eminent persons group had come with many questions involving the issues of violence, negotiations, and international sanctions. At the outset, I set the ground rules for our discussions. I am not the head of the movement, I told him. The head of the movement is Oliver Tambo in Lusaka. You must go and see him. You can tell him what my views are, but they are my personal views alone. They do not represent the views of my colleagues here in prison. They, all, all that being said, I favor the ANC beginning discussions with the government. Various members of the groups had concern about my political ideology and what a South Africa under ANC leadership might look like. I told them I was a South African nationalist, not a communist. That nationalists came in every hue and color, and that I was firmly committed to a non-racial society. I told them I believed in the Freedom Charter, that the Charter embodied principles of democracy and human rights, and that it was not a blueprint for socialism. I spoke of my concern that the white minorities should feel a sense of security in any new South Africa. I told them I thought many of our problems were a result of lack of communication between the government and the ANC, and that some of these could be resolved through actual talks. They questioned me extensively on the issue of violence, and while I was not yet willing to renounce violence, I affirmed in the strongest possible terms that violence could never be the ultimate solution to the situation in South Africa, and that men and women by their very nature required some kind of negotiated understanding. While I once again reiterated that these were my views and not those of the ANC, I suggested that if the government withdrew the army and the police from the township, the ANC might agree to a suspension of the armed struggle as a prelude to talks. I told him that my release alone would not stem the violence in the country or stimulate negotiations. After the group had finished with me, they planned to see both Oliver in, in, in Lusaka and government officials in Pretoria. In my remarks, I had sent messages to both places. I wanted the government to see that under the right circumstances we would talk, and I wanted Oliver to know that my position and his were the same. In May, the eminent persons group was scheduled to see me one last time. I was optimistic as they had been to both Lusaka and Pretoria, and I hoped that the seed of negotiation had been sowed. But the day before we were to meet, the South African government took a step that sabotaged whatever goodwill had been en engendered by the Commonwealth visitors. On the day the eminent persons group was scheduled to meet cabinet ministers, the South African Defense Force, under the orders of, under the orders of President Botha, 
launch airway and commando attacks on ANC bases in Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia and Zimbabwe. This orderly poison the talks and the eminent persons group immediately left South Africa. Once again, I felt my efforts to move negotiations forward had stalled. Oliver Tambo and the ANC had called for the people of South Africa to render the country ungovernable and the people were obliging. The state of unrest and political violence was reaching new heights. The anger of the masses were, was unrestrained. The townships were in upheaval. International pressure was growing stronger every day. On, on 12 June 19, 1986, the government imposed a state of emergency in an attempt to keep a lead on protests. In every outward way, the time seemed inauspicious for negotiations. But often the most dis discouraging moments are precisely the time to launch an initiative. At such times, people are searching for a way out of their dilemma. That month, I wrote a very simple letter to General Williamsey, the Commissioner of Prisons, saying merely, I wish to see you on a matter of national importance. I handed the letter to, the letter to Brigadier Munro on a Wednesday. That weekend, I was told by the commanding officer to be prepared to see General Williamsey, who was coming down from Pretoria. This meeting was not, was not treated in the usual fashion. Instead of of conferring with the generals in the visiting area, I was taken to his residence in the grounds of Bozmore itself. William C. is a direct fellow and we got down to business immediately. I told him I wanted to see Kobe Koeti, the Minister of Justice. He asked me why. I hesitated for a moment, reluctant to discuss political matters with a prison official, but I responded with frankness. I, wanted, I want to see the minister in order to raise the question of talks between the government and the ANC. He pondered this for a moment and then he said, Mandela, as you know, I'm not a politician. I cannot discuss such issues myself, for they are beyond my authority. He then paused, as if something had just occurred to him. It just so happens, he said, that the minister of justice is in Cape, is in Cape Town. Perhaps you can see him. I will find out. The general then telephoned the minister and the two spoke for a few moments. After putting down the phone, the general turned to me and said, and said the minister said, bring him, bring him around. Minutes later, we left the general's residence in his car bound for the minister's house in Cape Town. Security was light. Only one other car accompanied the general's vehicle. The ease and rapidity with which this meeting was set up made me suspect that the government might have planned this rendezvous in advance. Whether they had or not was immaterial. It was an opportunity to take the first step towards negotiation. At his official residence in the city, Koeti greeted me warmly and we settled down on comfortable chairs in his lounge. He apologized that I had not had a chance to change out of my prison clothes. I spent three hours in conversation with him and was struck by his sophistication and willingness to listen. He asked knowledgeable and relevant questions, questions that, that reflected a familiarity with the issues that divided the government and the ANC. He asked me under what circumstances we would suspend the armed struggle, whether or not I spoke for the ANC as a whole, whether I envisioned any constitutional guarantee for minorities in the new South Africa. His questions went to the heart of the issues dividing the government and the ANC. After responding in much the same way as I did to the eminent persons group, I sensed that Koweti wanted some resolution. What is the next step, he asked. I told him I wanted to see the state president and the foreign minister, Pick Botha. Koweti noted this on a small pad he had kept beside him, and he said he would send my request to the proper channels. He, we then shook hands and I was driven back to my solitary cell on the ground floor of Postmore Prison. I was greatly encouraged. I sensed the government was anxious to overcome the impasse in the country, that they were now convinced they had to de depart from their old positions. In ghostly outline, I saw the beginnings of a compromise. I told no one of my encounter. I wanted the process to be on the way before I informed anyone. Sometimes it is necessary to present one's colleagues with a policy that is already a fait accompli 
I knew that once they examined the situation carefully, my colleagues at Pusmo and in Lusaka would support me. But again, after this promising start, nothing happened. Weeks and then months passed without a question, without a word from Kuwaiti. In some frustration, I wrote him another letter. Chapter 91. Although I did not get a direct response from, from, from Kobe Kuwaiti, there were other signs that the government were preparing me for a different kind of existence. On the day before Christmas, Lieutenant